Welcome to Tuesday's edition of Big Blue Kickoff Live here on Giants.com as well as the mobile app. He's Howard Cross. I'm Lance Meadow with you for the next 60 minutes as we're here to break down all that is happening to the New York Giants and multiple ways to interact with us here on the program. You give us a ring, 201-939-4513, hashtag Giants Chat. As a reminder, you can find the archive of this show and our entire podcast network on the Giants mobile app, podcast platforms everywhere, and at Giants.com slash podcast. So today we're going to give a overview of the Giants offseason, which also entails looking ahead to 2023, because on NFL.com, and they do this every year, and I find this very interesting when we break down the article pertaining to the Giants, is they do a state of the union for all 32 teams. Adam Rank, who's an NFL.com writer, he takes his time to break it all down. So they had published the New York Giants article about two weeks ago, and we have not analyzed it yet on the program. So today I thought would be a good opportunity for us to really go through the ins and outs of what he raises. And he goes through various different topics, Howard. He talks about who he thinks could be a breakout candidate, okay. games to watch, right. the key additions during the course of the offseason that could make or break the team and what is considered a successful 2023 season. So let's start with the breakout star. He names Kayvon Thibodeau as the guy that he thinks <laughs> is going to put his name out there. And we've talked about this on previous shows, so yep. I mean, it's not like he's going out on a limb, but I think you could actually bring other players into consideration. But Thibodeau, you like what he did, especially towards the tail end of the season. You hope he stays healthy. There's no reason why he can't fulfill that level. Well, you know, like I, I keep telling people over and over, he got hurt in preseason. So, and and he yep. didn't he didn't get a serious injury, but he was hurt well enough to like the hamper and slow him down. So basically, it took him like four games to kind of get himself back up to speed. Once he got back up to speed, it took him four more games to get back up to like his speed. And after that, you started to see him like eight eight after the eighth game of the season you started to see him come on because he's like, okay, I know what to do. I'm not worried my, that my knee's going to give out or someone else is going to try to cut me. I can go full tilt. So I think that, you know, saying that he's going to be a breakout player is kind of a layup. Who would you say? Could be, give, give me somebody who's Sure. Tibble. No, absolutely. Well, that's why I didn't want to jump to the obvious one that he mentioned. Mm -hmm. I actually have been leaning towards Wondell Robinson. Wondell I think Robinson. he's a stronger candidate, which – I don't know if you'd agree. I don't think he comes to the forefront immediately. He also dealt with an injury last season. He had that flash game against the Lions. Remember yeah, when he had 100 yeah. receiving yards? If he stays healthy, I think he has an opportunity to make a name for himself. I'm going to go with Evan Neal. He's going to go unnoticed this year, but he's going to be playing well. So by, by playing well and not giving up sacks and not having holding calls, I think that he makes a big, huge leap forward. I think he'll be healthy, uh, being able to get down lower, and not not worry about himself so much. I think that uh, that's going to be the one that's going to going to be the guy that's going to have the the breakout season. But it won't be like, oh my God, look at all the stats. <laughs> well, be, of course, yeah, good luck trying like, to there see are, that. There are no stats. <laughs> that's what's going to help him have that's a right. breakout season. Yeah. yeah. All right. So we're basically all focusing on 2022 draft class members. Absolutely. Right? You absolutely. Got Thibodeau, that Adam Rank name, and then you're going with Evan Neal. I'm going with Wondell Robinson, and it's understandable to focus on that class because you had some highs and lows out of the group last year, and unfortunately, a few of the guys were banged up. I mean, if you want to go even deeper, Howard, Marcus McKeithen didn't play either in well, offensive lineman. Well, here's a guy that will also have what, what I guess people will say will be a breakout season that no one's talking about because it's kind of obvious and kind of not obvious. Daniel Jones. Sure. Daniel Jones – it could have 30 touchdowns, you know, or 40 touchdowns combined uh, between rushing and, and, and passing the ball. That would be considered a breakout season. And, like, you know, no offense to my, my man down in, in Baltimore. Love him to death, Mr. Jackson. But they got similar num similar numbers. And people just don't realize. He, he, Daniel just doesn't have the wins. So if Daniel has a breakout season, another player that, you know, that, that could be the guy. Well, he absolutely fits that bill, and this is year two yeah. in the offense, so there's more comfort. The weaponry around him has more comfort with the scheme. And you added build, Darren Waller. Yeah, and you're building up the offensive line, too, you know, so that it, it could be a big year for him. Yeah, no, I definitely would say that he could be somebody that ultimately wins that label, and we're going to bring up Daniel Jones in a little bit because mm -hmm. he was brought up, obviously, in yep. another section of this article. New face to know was another category that he brought up. New face to know. Hmm. He mentioned Darren Waller, given the addition okay. of him at the tight end position. But once again, just like we talked about other breakout candidates, I mean, we could throw out a number of other guys that you should be 
paying close attention to who the Giants added this offseason. Well, my my mine would be Banks or Hyatt. I would think one of those two rookies, uh, you know, even Schmitz. But I mean, yeah. even Schmitz. But I think Banks and Hyatt are going to have huge impacts this season. They're, I think they're going to, especially Banks, especially Banks. He's going to be the opposite side of Jackson. He's going to have to he's going to have to cover some really big time players. If he's you know in Philadelphia, he'll either be drawing Smith. You know, or the really big receiver. <laughs> and so it's going to be one of those things where he's going to be forced into action. Even when he goes to Dallas, he'll have a couple guys. So he's going to have four games where he's going to have top receivers in front of him, you know, every game. Then we go to Miami, you know, and play Miami. So he's got two guys down there. Waddle and Hill. Yeah, so he's got two guys down there. See, all over the league, he's going to come up against two guys. That you know, it's not gonna be like sure. you can match it. Like okay, Jackson's follow this guy around. It's gonna be like, hey, look, you stay on your side, I'll stay on my side. Let's try to hold it down. <laughs> so that's what it's gonna be the whole year for him. All right, so Deontay Banks, the team's first round pick. I'm going to go the route of free agency. Okay. I think Bobby Okereke is a new name to know who could very well have an impact on the roster. Right? We're talking about a three down linebacker. Yep, yep. who could play sideline to sideline. Wink's not going to necessarily have a reason to take him off the field. Mm -hmm. And he has probably the best opportunity to lead the team in tackles with Julian Love leaving in free agency. Of course, McKinney is another strong candidate. Yep. But Okereke, would it surprise me, Howard? He winds up definitely as the a top face tackler. You know, yep, definitely yeah. a face. You know, I like that I like that pick also. You know, like I said, again, Hyatt, you got to look at this kid. Because if this kid yep. is truly as fast and can get down the field with everything that's going to be happening underneath with all the, all the receivers, the tight end wall or, uh, you know, uh, Bellinger is a tight end, also going to be catching passes. All this stuff is going to be happening underneath. If he can take the top off the defense, it could be a problem. So it, it, it could be a good year. Yeah, there's a variety of strong candidates. And mm -hmm. once again, as we're going through this, an opportunity for you to weigh in at 201-939-4513. If you want to name breakout stars as well as new faces to know that obviously could very well put their stamp on this team. Other notable categories that he discusses okay. is he goes really position by position. Will the Giants be able to rely on one of their wide receivers being the number one guy is one question he poses. I want to pose all these questions, then okay. we'll take them one by one. And then another anchor to emerge on the offensive line is something also that he discusses. So let's start with the wide receiver group. He talks about there's a wealth in numbers, and we've discussed that too, right, Howard, on yeah. this show. A lot of depth, a lot of options. But is there going to be, when it's all said and done in 2023, are we going to be focusing on one guy that separates himself from the rest of the pack? That's the question that he's bringing to the forefront here. So it, it's going to be... <laughs> This, that's a tough question because it's going to be so many guys. First, you got to figure out who's going to make the team. So, you know, name the guys you know that you know are going to make the team. Give me your top five. Well, first, let's agree on a number standpoint. Would you say six guys? Six they're guys. Keep it wide receiver. At least six, and then it's going to be at least one or two on the what do they call the practice squad? Guys. Practice squad. Okay, but let's focus on the fifty-three guys. Okay, let's get to six. Okay, so Isaiah Hodgins, I would say, yeah. is a lock. Okay. Paris Campbell is a lock. Yeah. Jalen Hyatt is a lock. Yeah. That's half. Wandell Robinson is a lock. Yeah. That's four. Okay, here is now where things get a little bit more interesting. I like Colin Johnson a lot. If he's healthy, I think he has a very good chance to make the team. Okay. So, to me, he could be five. Now we're talking about one more spot between Sterling Shepard, Darius Slayton, and Jamison Crowder. I'll throw into the mix. Okay, so I would go I would go the first the first three that you name. Um, okay, so you're going Hodgins, Campbell, and Hyatt. You're yeah. agreeing with me. Okay, then Wondell Robinson. That was I, my fourth guy. I would say Wondell Robinson because he's a newer draft pick. Okay, so we're in agreement with those four being locks. Yeah. So now we have two more spots. I threw out Colin Johnson as a guy to watch if he could stay healthy. I would go Shepard over Johnson. Okay, so Shepard is five for you. Yeah. Then who's six, though? Oh, my God. Who, give me some... I, I'll, I'll Slayton. Leave, well, well, let me give you. Yeah, I'm Slayton. Slayton to me is six because I think Shepard is a possibility to start on PUP. So if Shepard's on PUP, if Shepard's on PUP, he doesn't then, count against the some, roster. Then somebody else is correct. Then, so that that's how could, I'm thinking about it. Then it then it could be Crowder then, and all reason it could be Crowder, it's because he's a return guy also. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. He so, can carve out a role on yeah, special so, teams. So if, if you know, out of the guys we mentioned, a lot of them are quote unquote you know, basically they're all receivers, nothing else, but. Crowder can, you know, add to the spot. He can be, you know, return guy. And we need a punt returner desperately. And if he's if he can do it and not be in the day to day, the big mix of things, 
it can help the team out tremendously. So I'm going to say Crowder right now. Now, it's possible you could see Eric Gray serve as a return man, the running back they drafted out of Oklahoma. Gary Brightwell is somebody that we've seen. And then Darnay Holmes, maybe, as a punt returner. No. 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 You don't like that at no, all because no, no, you no. like the regular guys not being involved in it's, special it's, teams. It's is not, that the argument? It's, or? it's not even that. Okay, so the back from Oklahoma, yes, maybe. Okay. But if he's in action, if it all depends on Saquon. Saquon signs then, yeah, you can use him as a returner. Saquon doesn't sign, you're going to need him more down-to-down kind of in That's the fair. offense. And if you need him down-to-down, as we saw with Jackson, it could turn out poorly if he's back there returning the ball. Uh, not that that's – you know, you can't take that out of the game, but you want to use a guy that he's a returner. Crowder is a guy, not that he's expendable, but he's a guy who has experience, yep. understands the angles, knows how to get down. You know, all the things that you think of, he knows how to do. He would be the more – seasoned returner out of the group that we're talking about. Sure. No, I'm completely with you, though. I want to pull back the layers here based on what you alluded to. Okay. Okay. So forgive me if I digress from the main topic at hand, because I've had these conversations during the regular season. Are you of the mindset that regular starters should be protected and not used not on special all. teams. Okay. Not no, I just wanted to all. know where you stood. I'm, I'm just saying. I'm, I'm saying when special teams. When you think of special teams, the special teams is the entire team, right? The returners are different. Okay. Returners are regular starters. Whether you under whether that that people translate that or not, if you're a return guy, you have a special talent. Yeah. And that makes you a starter at that position. If you go out of the game, then they start filling in with other players. If something happens to you, like when it happened to James last year, and he got a couple hits, and then he, he couldn't hold on to the ball because he was getting blasted out there, and then all of a sudden they start flipping guys in. You saw the re- the you know the outcome. That's why I, the returner is a starter. So you'll have twenty two starters and a returner who start. Returners are like kickers. If you don't have one, then you're searching your team for one, and it gets a little shaky. Not just because they handling the ball and ball security. It's because they don't know what to do when running the ball or or how close is too close. All that starts to happen. You're like, hey, just you know, fair catch the ball. You know, like. But I was open. They, they'll look at the like, I, I could have ran. Fair catch the ball. On the third time, he's going to get out there. He goes, he's going to try it. And when he tries it, why didn't you fair catch? Well, I thought you had him. Yeah, that, that, that's when guys get hurt. Well, I guess what I was getting at, I'm with you. I completely agree. Mm-hmm. They are an extension of the starting group. My point is, a Dory Jackson, for example, who you were referencing last yeah. year, I did not have a problem with him serving as a dual role player from a starting standpoint, meaning he's your starting corner and you think he's your best return guy. Throw him out there. I, I had a problem with it because, again, even though like catching the ball in practice when no one's hitting you, you're not a returner. You're just out there fielding punts. Catching the ball in a game when you have to like run or something, if, if, if I'm telling Dory Jackson, hey, look, we'll listen to us on the sideline. We'll say run. Most of the time I'd be saying, fair catch, fair catch, put your hand up. If it's run, it means no one's around you. Our return team, and our, no correction, our our return block, <laughs> I'll say, hasn't been the best, hasn't been stellar. So like most of the time, there's one to three guys that are free running down the field at the returner. That means you got to make two guys miss before you even get started. No, that's just not. Unless you're a returner, that's just not something you can see. Because basically, a returner looks up to see the ball, starts to get in position. He takes a look at the coverage, and then he looks back up at the ball. He knows who's coming free when he looks up that sec- when he looks down at them. And if you're not used to you know identifying guys, like if it's a right return, I'm doing a right return. I got to look over here to see if this guy's blocked. Up, down, up. Okay, I think he's blocked. These three guys over here could be free. Returners, they look, they look up. <laughs> and then they do it again. <laughs> yeah. So it's like, it's a big difference. And you can see, if you watch them do it, you'll see them do it every time. Real returners look up. They look they look across the field. They look up again. They'll look from the backside to the front side to see wherever, wherever their return is. They'll look back to forth. If it's a middle return, they'll look both ways in the middle. They'll look at the coverage. They'll take that second, and they'll look back at the ball. And then they might take a second peek even before they catch the ball. But no, I don't trust if you're not a returner and you're doing it in practice, especially these days, 
because they've taken a lot of contact out of practice, it is an almost impossible to do. So, meaning you feel more comfortable with a guy that came directly out of college, you're saying, as a main return man? If you're, that- do, if I'm just feel more comfortable with guys that are doing it. Like, you gotta, you gotta be doing it. You gotta be like, that's like, okay, I made a team and, you know, I'm, I'm a DB or I'm a, I'm a running back or I'm a receiver. I'm whatever I am. But I'm here because I'm their returner. Like, you could be a Pro Bowl returner. Oh, absolutely! Yeah, Look at make, Cordero Patterson, yeah, for you example. Can make, you can make yeah. make you can make Pro Bowls and go whatever. Sure, Devin and, Hester. Yeah, but yeah. if you're not a returner and you're like that, well, this is one of my skills. Okay, you're testing it because skills. The, the guys that are running down are running down full speed. That's why they've taken almost eliminated the kickoff return. No, well, especially with this new rule too. Yeah, they're eliminating it because guys aren't quite returners. You know, you get back there, you're in the end zone, like, I'm, I'm going to bring it out eight yards. Okay, look, just fair catch it, and we'll let you bring it out to 25. Guys are still trying to return it. We're going to pooch kick it to make that guy return it. Like, it's like they know that these guys aren't used to handling the ball and looking at coverage. And now that you can't wedge up and protect, guys could just run by. If I'm running full speed down, you're trying to find an angle to just to knock me off course. Now they've moved guys up. I would have not had a shot of blocking anybody in, in that kind of protection. Guys, been like I've been like running backwards. Like, why are you running out? I, I, I got to catch this guy. This guy's gonna be running like a four four by the time he gets to me. So it, it's it's a big it's a big difference, and it's that's why they changed the kickoff return almost totally. All right, so let's bring it back full circle here to our wide receiver conversation. So just to clarify. When it comes to the six guys that we're looking at, you got Crowder as number six because of the return. Yeah. Okay, so now that we have our six situated, okay. of those six, could you see one guy in particular doing a lot of the heavy lifting game to game? Or is it more of what we've also had previous conversations about? We could fluctuate this season. We could see Jamison... Crowder be a leader in the receiver core one week. You could see Jalen Hyatt another week, Isaiah Hodgins, and you're not necessarily going to have a consistent guy that emerges. Well, Paris is the guy that's the quickest guy, right? And he's quick in small spaces. And he could stretch the field. And, too. and he could stretch yeah. the field. His problem has been he hasn't been healthy. Correct. So yep. I, I'd love to vote for him. Can't. Hodgins is the guy that's been the most consistent guy and that come on came on the scene last year. Just, you know, gets open, catches the ball, very dependable. It's not flashy. He's just open. So I think that's the guy that's going to lift, going to be the guy that's going to be the intermediate, you know, quick, quick, the out guy, all these other things. Wendell Robson could be that guy if he's healthy, but I'm with you. right now it's Hodges. Now on the, on, the, on the, you know, off chance to where able to throw the ball down the field, the deep threats will be Slayton and Hyatt. But I think there's going to be Hodges in the middle. He's going to be the guy that's going to catch a lot of passes right there. He's going to be probably on the opposite side of Waller. And it's going to be like, okay, well, he's right there. You know where he is. Catch it. And you can't focus on him. And I think Waller's going to create a lot of opportunity for the receivers because now you can't focus on one guy or, or lean your coverage to one side because if he's over there, you got to pay attention to him. Sure. Yeah. I'm with you. But I do think, as you hit on, Wondell Robinson could be a sneaky guy that does become the consistent weapon because he also could operate in the middle of the field. We saw that against the Detroit Lions I, a little look, bit. I, I like him a lot, but coming off an injury, I worry about him. Just like I said, Paris, same thing. Coming off injuries, had his best season I think last year. He did. Yep. You know, maybe that'll give him two years in, and he'll be he'll be more consistent. Uh, just coming off an injury, it's just a tough thing. No, very fair points, mm-hmm. and that's a bit of the gray area when you do this exercise because you yep. just don't know who's going to be the most durable. Yep. That's why Hodgins is the best bet to your point because for the most part. He's, he's held up yeah, he's the last two healthy. years, Absolutely. other than his first year in the NFL with Buffalo. These other guys, Sterling Shepard injury history, Wondell Robinson, mm-hmm. Paris Campbell, mm-hmm. Colin Johnson, mm-hmm. and Jalen Hyatt hasn't played in the NFL yet. No. And Slayton is another guy that's been a little bit banged up yeah, during well, the course of his career. Yeah. A little, but not as bad as the others. I, I think Slay- a Slayton's big thing has been like he's dropped some easy passes. You know, some the more difficult the ball is, the quicker he's going to catch it, the easier it's going to be for him. When it gets to like a little, you know, just – too easy sometimes he might drop it and that's that's been his problem and I think that's more of a focus thing than anything and I think he's going to focus a lot more because there's more competition around but I think you also brought up another interesting point if we're to focus on one guy emerging players like Campbell Hyatt and Sladen if you're relying on the deep ball to do Mm -hmm. damage 
the volume of targets no, is going to fluctuate, right? You, so, you, meaning you can't go into every game saying he's going to get three you, to four catches for 50 yards. You, you get, my point. Your, your deep ball threats in, in a game, like if you throw four of them a game, that's a lot. Sure. And, and that's not looking for four completions. This is like throwing the ball deep four times to – make the defense respect the moment. And it's got to be in a situation where the receiver has a chance to catch it because if he doesn't have a chance to catch it, they'll notice that you're just throwing it deep and they'll be like, yeah, whatever. You keep keep doing that. But if you throw it out there and it's like, oh, just off his fingertips, they're like, "Uh (laughs) uh-oh. Stay a little closer to it. Make sure you don't do that again. So that's what we're hoping for, you know, for the season because that's pretty much what every team is doing around the league is like, okay, slant, slant, cross, cross, out, out, cross, cross, post. He was okay. He was a slant, cross, cross, corner, go route. Okay, all right. Okay, these guys are they're, they're actually throwing these. Back up a little bit. Just make sure they don't do it. Safeties can't come up and play down in the run or anything, you know. And with I, I don't know exactly how the offense is run. So if it's a check with me kind of thing where he could like, okay, the safety's peeking. He's down here a little bit and look. He he makes an audible all of a sudden. You have you know run pass option and the and the pass isn't a quick out but a fake to the out and it goes deep. Those could be problematic for teams. And if the and if the offensive line holds up, that's what I expect. Speaking of the offensive line, beautiful transition. I thank you, <laughs> partner, in terms of helping me out there. And this was the other question in this category that he posed. So is somebody else going to emerge as the anchor on the offensive line? We know Andrew Thomas is the mm-hmm. most reliable guy most promise he brings up two guys he brings up john michael schmitz who obviously has a pathway to step into the starting center position Mm -hmm. could he emerge immediately or is it going to be the player that you mentioned earlier evan neal who had ups and downs last season does he become a little bit more consistent and does he now throw his name in the hat with andrew thomas as being the anchor if you want to use that label on the offensive line, I don't know about anchors, but I think Evan Neal will have to play better next, play better this coming year. I think that his his side will have to be held up. I think that if Schmitz can hold up against some of these bigger, stronger guys that he's going to be playing against at the center position, I think that that's it. You have one tackle on one side, one tackle on the other side, and you got a center. If then basically you, those are your anchors. You have your three guys that that you need. Both sides are protected in the center. The guards will just have to be better after that I expect Neil to take a huge leap forward and I'm not saying it because he's a Bama guy or anything I just think guys <laughs> I think offensive linemen in their second year take big leaps forward and they and, and if they can play you start to see really how good they're going to be I know that you know Tom Andrew was was they were giving him a hard time but he had a bad ankle for the first couple of years once he got healthy you saw who he was yeah so Neil played on a bad knee for like I think six or you know five to eight games, however long it was. Once now he's healthy, you're gonna get a chance to see who he is. So that that's what I'm hoping for and we'll see that, you know, early in the season. Yeah, I think both rookie seasons coincidentally for those players are somewhat similar. Yeah. Because they both had those nagging injuries and it's understandable why you saw some struggles. But to your point, and Thomas like, they, got they healthy. Kept playing. Yeah, they kept playing. They did. They they, yep. they they wouldn't, you know, okay, how healthy are you? I, I'm about seventy five percent. I can go. Uh, you do know you play tackle right there, dudes. <laughs> Going up against the premier pass rushers <laughs> exactly. in the NFL. Yeah, who are not necessarily going to take it easy on you because no. you're 75% healthy. But you could have two really good tackles, which is, I think, what you were alluding to. If you don't handle your business on the interior, Howard, yeah. it doesn't make a difference well, at the end that's of the where, day. You know, that's what killed Tom Brady every time someone got after him was up the up the middle of the field. Yep. The edges never really bothered him because he could step up. If he couldn't step up, he'd always have a hard time, and that goes for any quarterback. Well, and here's the true test for John Michael Schmitz within the NFC East. I mean, what do the three division rivals have in common? <laughs> big big interior defensive linemen. Especially Washington yeah. with Allen and Payne. Yeah. Well, you know, he gets to practice every day against, you know, Dex. Yep. <laughs> if you practice against Dex every day, you know, it, 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 it's going to wear on you. He's going he's gonna to find out really, really quickly, even with no pads on, Okay, so this is what it's going to look like. This <laughs> is so that's what it's on a consistent look. basis. Yeah, yeah. it's and, and Robinson. Robinson's a big dude too. Sure. Oh, yeah, Sean Robinson. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. The two of those guys. And it's funny you brought that up, Howard, because Bobby Johnson. I think I brought this up on one of last week's shows. He spoke to the media last week, mm-hmm. Giants offensive line coach, and he was saying the rude awakening for John Michael Schmitz is going to be when training camp starts. Because you know they were asking him, "What have you seen out of John Michael Schmitz?" And he's like, 
He's we in, don't have pads on. He's yet. in pajamas. <laughs> what, what am I supposed to tell you guys? It's classroom focus at this point. Yeah. Okay, he's learning the scheme. But the fact was to take it to the next level is the first day of training camp when the physicality comes all the way up. Yep. Not even partially, all the way up. It's going to be very interesting to see how he handles it. Yeah, that. and yeah. it could very well be a wake up call. But yeah. you actually you want to see him have those days where it's just Dexter Lawrence is just getting the better of him because no, I no? don't. I want to see him well, stand up sure, of course, and do but... his job day one, and I want it to be like, okay, Dex is getting after him, but he's fighting, you're able to fight him off and hold him off. I don't want him to be – the problem with guys, and, and this is just across the league, and I don't think Dex would do this, but back in my day if we played against somebody and within our own team, if a guy couldn't hold up, it's like, okay, we don't really need you on the team if you can't hold up, and like, okay – Get in front of so and so. Like, all right, if, if you put him out here, I'm not going to take it easy on him. Like, you're not supposed to. Sure. We want to see what he's going to what he's going to be able to do. And you, we saw a lot of guys crumble over over our time in, in the NFL. Some guys would just even leave. Like, okay, I'm done. I'm, this wasn't for me. So you have to be careful of of that because you don't want to. In this day and age, we don't want to damage anybody's will to play. In my day, it was like break the sword, make them quit, and that's that's the difference. The evolution of emotions is what you're getting at. No, it's, with not, it's no evolution of emotions. Everybody just got soft. They're like, okay, <laughs> he's going to be okay. Don't worry. Don't. Oh, you're going to you, have Howard. the next day. Yes. <laughs> I, I could use that pat on the back. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I needed a little bit of pep hey, talk. I've had coaches tell me, he's like, hey, look, you don't have bad days. You you got to play better. Like, oh, everybody has a bad day. He's like, are you a brain surgeon? Yeah. Well, no. If you were, could you have a bad day? Well, that's a little bit different. <laughs> I mean, you went to the extreme. That's true. Well, I, but, but I, had, I had an uncle who was a demolitions expert. No bad days. Well, because if he did... Okay, then. So you get a job. <laughs> Do your job. You can't have okay. a bad day. No, no. I, I think that's a very fair point. But in fairness, the center of the New York Giants... You can't if he has have a bad, a bad day. But can't if he has day. one, it's not life or death that we're discussing. Okay, you brought up life and death scenarios. I'm just saying, you can't so, have a bad day. You look at it all the same. What about broadcasters? Are we allowed bad days? Or no, we're you're also, not, you're, no, we're not allowed If bad you have days. a bad day, you know yes. what happens? Somebody sitting in your seat. No, that's true. Yeah, well, <laughs> well somebody is maybe, you know, trying to nip Man. at the coattails. I agree, yes. No, nip at coattails, but, nothing. They will replace you. Well, I could point to a few individuals that <laughs> yeah. have had bad days and are still alive and well. So okay. I wouldn't necessarily put them in the demolition man category right. or the brain surgery. But you're right. If we're talking about surgery on moi, mm -hmm. then yes, yeah. that person better not have a bad day. No. I'm with you. Yes. <laughs> 201-939-4513 is the telephone number. Hashtag Giants Chat on Twitter. A few reminders before we open up the phone lines in a number of other categories that Howard and I are going to get to that this article raises. Giants Auto Podcast. Make sure you check that out. You can subscribe on your favorite podcast platform. You can also go to Giants.com slash podcast. The 2023 NFL schedule, it's officially out. Single-game tickets are now on sale. Don't miss the Giants at MetLife Stadium this season. Visit Giants.com slash tickets to secure your seat. And you can actually take your fandom to the next level with a season ticket membership. Stay connected to the club all year round, not just on game days. Memberships are now available for the 2023 season. To learn more about all the exclusive member benefits, visit Giants.com slash tickets. Limited inventory is available. Also, the Giants official connected TV streaming app. It's Giants TV. It brings you original video content and game highlights on demand and direct to Big Blue fans. Giants TV, it's free. It's on Apple TV, Roku, Amazon Fire TV, as well as the Giants mobile app. All right, let's open up the phone lines. Tom is in Stratford. He gets us going here on BBKL. What's happening, Tom? What do you got for us? Uh, good afternoon, gentlemen. I just wanted to um, mention that or say, in my opinion, that Evan Neal was having the best games of, of his season last year right before he got hurt. And, you know, a knee injury for a big guy is a very tough thing to come back from. I think he came back too soon myself. I wasn't expecting him to return last year, but. I'm glad he did, but um, I'm very confident that he's going to have an outstanding season. I love Alabama football players. I'm not <laughs> just saying I was there. I don't know. Uh, I, I would take the latter more so than the former, but go ahead. Terrible. Yes. But uh, I, I think he's going to have an outstanding season. I think I expect him to step up, and I'm not, you know, um, and I also think John Michael Schmitz will do okay in the center there because let's remember. He's a six-year college player, and um, he's 24 years old. He's the same age as Andrew Thomas, so um, he's not your typical rookie, let's say. 
Well, and uh, I would agree with you. But I, I just think it's not so much the experience and the intellect. I don't doubt any of that. It's more of are you seeing Duran Payne and Jonathan Allen-esque type of players on a consistent basis in college? That's the well, bigger question. Well, of course question. not. Yeah, of course well, not, but that, cha- that changes really the game, Tom, the doesn't it? Does that not change well, the game? Well, it does. <laughs> I mean, well, hopefully he's pumping iron. <laughs> well, of course. Well, he played in the what, what, what division is that? The well, he big, played in the Big Ten. Yeah, so he's yeah. he's tall. Oh, big, I'm not, I mean, the Big he, Ten certainly has good he competition. Saw huge, big defensive tackles every week. It, it, he'll be fine. Trust me, he'll be fine. I'm surprised you're going to bat for the Big Ten. I, Are you sure you didn't wake up just, on the wrong side nah, of the bed this morning? it's just a bunch of big old dudes. Okay. It, offensive linemen and defensive guys. linemen. And, well, I mean, it's a, you got it, Tom. Ten. Appreciate the phone call. Yeah. But, <laughs> I mean, it's not the SEC, though, the last no, time I checked, they, right? No, those are big, fast guys. But these are big, oh, okay. there's a lot so. of big guys in the Big Ten, man. <laughs> it's cold. You have to put on weight. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, Mr. Heated Vest on the sideline. Hey, line. man, He's talking I'm about freezing, the cold weather. man. I'm freezing. I don't like it. Well, this is the <laughs> first time I've heard you publicly complain. Every time I've teased you on that subject, you've taken it like a man. I, and I've cold. had no issue. It's cold. <laughs> oh, so now we're getting to the, the true issues and the challenges that Howard Cross sees <laughs> on the sideline. See, you got to leave it to the offseason for him to... Uh, Papa, how's yes. the weather? Like, okay, seriously, Bob, get out of the booth. Come over here. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm joking. <laughs> of course. All right, let's get back to the ins and outs of this article on the state of the New York Giants. And by the way, if you do want to glance at it, it's on NFL.com. They have all 32 teams highlighted. So we went over the breakout star, the new player to watch, question marks with respect to the roster. And this was the interesting part. He poses the question, what would it take to say the 2023 season is successful for the Giants. And the reason why it's an interesting question, most people would say, well, of course, making the playoffs and doing damage, that's the true indication of success. Yes, but is it fair to say, Howard, the Giants exceeded expectations in 2022? I think they surprised a lot of people. I don't think that's crazy to say. So is it more about the individuals and the progression of the young guys, specifically Daniel Jones, and all of that could happen, but maybe the Giants do take a step back with respect to the win total because of the teams around them and the fact that they did play a lot of close games last season. I think if they if they up their points per game, you know, to like 24, 27, I think if they, you know, kind of stay steady on defense but have a better job in the run game, like really have a good job in the run game. Uh, somewhere float around that 9-10 game win uh, season. If they can get more than 10 wins, of course, they're in the playoffs. Around nine wins should be close to being in the playoffs. So I think there will be a lot of, you know, infighting and guys, you know, taking each other out. But if they could do that, if, if the team could do that, I think that's that's a success. I don't think that you can actually say they need to get back into the playoffs desperately because – Last year was an anomaly, not for just the Giants, but for the entire league. Green Bay was bad. Tampa was bad. Uh, New Orleans was bad. Like, everybody was just, you know, the South, the, the NFC South. Oh, the whole di- division. Didn't even yeah. exist. <laughs> well, that's didn't one way even, to put it. And the yeah. NFC East basically was like, okay, we were we were fighting at one time to get almost every team in the division sure. in the playoffs. Yep. So you don't – I don't – Totally expect that. Uh, you know, last year Seattle had a surprise showing out there. The Rams disappeared. Uh, yeah, San Francisco had 19 quarterbacks. <laughs> Only 19? Uh, just 19 yeah. I can think of. Okay. Uh, so you, all that's going to factor in going forward this this year. So, you know, there's nobody in the north to be worried about except for Detroit. Uh, so Detroit's going to be the team to beat in the north. Men- people say Minnesota, Minnesota. I'm like, Detroit's the team to beat in the north. Like, you know, Kirk Cousins and all those guys, they're great. God bless them. But, you know, Dan Campbell has got his guys believing. They play hard. Yep. Um, you know, golf has turned into, you know, I don't think he turned into I think he just con- has been consistent when they let him play. He's been he's been consistent, took a team to the Super Bowl. Uh, their defense has been the thing I thought was in question. If they get a better defense, it's going to be hard. Then you got the Bears who just, you know, got some weapons. Offensive For Justin Fields. Yeah, yep. Austin, the, the offensive line got a little bit better. Green Bay, you, you don't know what you're going to get out of love, so it's like that. Th- those guys are gone. And I still think Seattle's going to be the team to beat out West, even though San Francisco is really talented. But, you know, Seattle's a more complete team. San Francisco's going to be trying to find a quarterback for maybe two or three weeks. So they're going to be starting in a hole. Arizona, I don't expect anything out of them. So, that you know, kind of that's it. And, and again, the Giants, the Cowboys – the Eagles, even Washington, 
I think that they're going to have, you know, going to kind of be incestuous, eat each other up. I hope a little bit. I hope everybody gets a win against somebody, and hopefully that, that changes things. But everybody else, I, I don't know. I mean, wh- what's going to happen in the South? Are they going to get any better? Well, I think Derek Carr is going to help the Saints. I do think that you should see a better record out of that group. I could tell you overwhelmingly <laughs> agree with me. Yeah. You're – Part of the Derek Carr bandwagon, I could yeah, tell. I, I love Derek Carr. He's a nice oh, kid. Oh, you could have fooled he, me he, with that facial a expression. Super nice kid. I just don't trust him as a quarterback. Well, I will say this: when you look at the rest of the landscape, Howard, mm-hmm. I would take Derek Carr over anybody else associated with the other teams right now, as it stands. <laughs> um, and that may not be saying much because I mean, think about it. Carolina. You're going with a rookie. You do have Andy Dalton, but a, Andy a, Dalton, I don't think is going to play the whole season. A really good rookie. Really good rookie, but he has yet to play one NFL game. I know he's an Alabama guy, and we can't talk bad about the Crimson I'm, Tide. I'm not saying that. crime of the century kid, on this kid, program. Kid won the Heisman. Like Without a kid, doubt. Kid is But talented. can he play a game or two before we crown him? I'm not crowning him. I'm just saying. That's all I'm saying. super talented. Do they have a roster around him? Yeah. They do. They did a nice job bringing yeah. in some receivers. Yeah, and Frank Reich, I think, is a and solid and coach. And they got the a decent position. offensive lineman. Defense off the line around him, so he could he could he could make some noise, but I don't know how much noise. But the rest of his division, I don't really think that much of. So, yeah, well, and that gets back yeah. to my point about yeah. the Saints. Yeah, could very yeah. well be in the driver's yeah, seat true. and win that division. But the point that I think you were getting at, and this is where I wanted to return to, the NFC East was a product of all four of those teams playing the AFC South. Meaning, I think they yeah. benefited right from those common opponents. Yeah. Isn't that fair to say? That's true. And that's why those four teams were all in the thick of things, as you mentioned, in the playoff hunt. Schedule's completely yeah. different Jacksonville this year. Jacksonville was struggling. Tennessee was struggling. Everybody kind of struggled. Houston, like, everybody oh, played. Yeah, everybody I mean, look at that struggling. division. Yeah. So, you know, they benefit. And that's what you should do. In the NFL, you got to take advantage the, of the, opportunities. And this year, it's going to be Miami. If Tua's healthy, could be they could be Super Bowl contenders. Buffalo, I won't give them Super Bowl contenders, but they should be really, really tough. New England actually has an offensive coordinator now, so you know they could they could take a big step forward. And the Jets got you know uh, what's that that old guy named Aaron Rodgers? That's right, Aaron Rodgers. That's right. But you know again, so they they're all again they're going to beat up on each other. So are they going to be looking at the NFC East to be like okay? We get a break this week. We get to play the East. <laughs> like, well, or, or they're going to be like, oh, no, we got to play the NFC East. <laughs> so it's going to be one or the other. Well, I mean, I don't necessarily think that they're going to look at the NFC East and say it's a break. It's just possible that the AFC East could gain more victories than the AFC South did against the NFC East this year. That's not crazy. Possibly. Not sure. They're not. You know, you, you, it, one of those teams is going to beat the Eagles. Sure. I could see that happening. One of those teams is going to beat the Cowboys. That could happen, too. Okay. You won those. I know. You really you know, think that's a bit of a stretch to say that one of those teams can beat the Eagles or the Cowboys? The Buffalo Bills can't beat one of those two teams. Mm. I, I, you know I what? Mean, I, don't I, think I, that's I, that crazy. I, I just saw Josh Allen. I saw two Josh Allens last year. If we get the one that was in the first of the year where he was jumping over tall buildings in a single <laughs> bound, yes, then you got a great. You they got a great chance. If you get the one that's in the end of the year where it's like. I'm a little tired. I'm a little beat up. <laughs> so well, in the red zone interceptions were a killer, and I year. need some help. So, and I think you know you got your 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 top receiver arguing with with your team right now after getting paid all that money. There's gonna be a lot going on in Buffalo. They gotta get a lot. They gotta get some things. There's handled. drama there. Yes. Yeah, they have to get some things handled. So that's one team I'm not gonna go like. Oh, the Buffalo could get us right off the bat. I would say more in Miami because I'm a little worried about the, all that speed. Okay. Uh, and do we play them in Miami? The yes. Dolphins, yes. Yeah, that is not a good. That's not a good matchup for for anybody. Everybody that goes from the East to Miami, that could be bad. You know, at least well, even we, New England seen that over the years, yeah. and they're in the division. So uh, New England, I'm fifty fifty on New England. I don't know who they're going to be or what. The Jets, if Aaron Rodgers can make it through the season, they'll be a tough team to, to deal with all year. If what I think is going to happen, if their offensive line's not holding up, he won't make it more than four or five games, and he'll be on the sideline rooting on that that kid Zach that everybody wanted to put through under the bus. So that's where their season's kind of you know tapering on if their offensive line holds up. But they have a really good defense, and that unit is going to give going to be awesome. Trouble going to be awesome, but if that quarterback goes down, they go down. Oh, it's a game changer, yeah. sure. Yeah, that's a sinking ship. So yeah. But in fairness. 
Aaron has had years in Green Bay where the offensive line hasn't been great, and he's been able to hold up. I know there were a few seasons with the clavicle, I'll give you that. But for the most part, he well, had far from a juggernaut of an offensive line for the bulk of his career the, the Dolphins in Green de- Bay. Uh, let's do it. The Dolphins defense, suspect. Buffalo defense, really good, right? Really, really good. And, and they Ma- added Leonard Floyd now. Yeah, and, Le- and, and New England's defense, pretty decent. So he's got four games where he's going to get – they're going to get after him, really get after him. Then he's got to play the Cowboys and the Eagles, the, those two teams yep. specifically. The Giants hopefully as well, but the Cowboys, the Eagles, and 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 Washington who can come up the middle right at you. Yeah, he's going to have a hard time. No, there's no doubt about it. Yeah. I, I'm not painting it as a picnic. <laughs> okay. okay. Yeah. I'm with you there. Yeah. I just feel as if so that I think that the NFC will do well against the AFC East. NFC East will do well against the AFC East. I don't. I don't think it's going to be lopsided in, in any stretch of the imagination. No, and that's not what I was insinuating. But I do think it's a far bigger challenge than the AFC South. Yes, last yeah, well, year. But, well, you know, playing anybody would have been <laughs> unfortunately. Yeah. Well, I mean, because there are some teams that you could have went in and swept the AFC South. I don't think everyone in the NFC East is going to sweep the AFC the AFC East. Yeah, that's but, my point. But, but but the NFC East also plays the NFC West. I think that's an easier schedule when you play in the NFC. I think that San Francisco is going to be tough because of their defense. I think Seattle can be tough. But the other two teams. The Rams and the Cardinals, they have some question marks. (laughs) Some? (laughs) Well, if you look at the division, though, in comparison, last year the Giants played the NFC North. Yeah. Okay, that was the division they got. Detroit turned out to be a tough team. Yeah. Okay. Green Bay, we were just talking about, had mm-hmm. an iffy year. Mm-hmm. Minnesota won all those close games. Yeah. And that's why they had a they, really good record. Won, and the won. Bears were in mm-hmm. rebuild mode. Yeah. So you had pretty much 50 50, really no different okay. than the NFC West, right? Okay. Yeah. That's I would true. say those are more of a, a scratch. Yeah. I think it's a scratch. Whereas right. the AFC East, though, I'm, uh, my argument is it's, it's an way, upgrade. A huge upgrade from the South. Correct. Okay. Exactly. So that's why I'm saying. So that's why I'm saying as well. I'm saying that, like I said, if they get close to that 9 10 win thing, I don't know if it'll put them in the playoffs, but that, that'll be good for them. And I tell you what, 8 to eight to 10 wins, the quarterback and the offensive line stay healthy for most of the year, if not the entire year. That's a double. That's a win for the team. If you if you can go through the season with eighty five percent of your players being healthy, you got a chance for a lot of good things to happen. So a lot and we have we have a lot of players with with injury history. So that's what you'd have to worry about. This was the point that Adam Rank brought up in the article. I just want to quote an exact line, and that's why I posed the question to you. He writes, "Quote: Here's my thing: the Giants could regress in the win column." but have an amazing season from Jones, confirming that the quarterback continues to be on track. That's pretty good, right? All that said, in a kind of wide-open NFC, getting back to the playoffs is a more concrete target than continuing to head in the right direction. This could be somewhat of a weird season, end quote. I, I get it. I get what he's saying. He's saying that they're, like everybody said, that when you play better talent, you you don't win as many games. Giants had a lot of close games. Exactly. They're, and they're going to be playing close. They're going to be playing, you know, tooth and nail with some better talent. Uh, again, I'm not discrediting the talent they're playing against, and I'm not being a homer in any stretch of the imagination. I'm just looking at last season as this could be the new trend, not just for the Giants, but for the, for the league, where they're just teams aren't, that are historically great or we've we've crowned them and they haven't won or whatever now, outside of Kansas City with Mahomes I don't really see a, a you know a team that's going to be that dominant a juggernaut the, you're yeah saying. a juggernaut I, I think the Eagles are going to play play great but again they have better competition this year so it's going to be interesting to see you know can Green and Smith you know be that dominant on the outside can that offensive line hold up against some of these better defensive lines for the entire year it's not going to be this like you said, we're not playing AFC South the whole time. Well, this is what I will say, and I'm with you. I don't think, and it's more important for the Giants' perspective to look at the nature of the NFC more so than the Kansas City, right? Mm Because you don't really have to worry about those teams unless you're fortunate enough to get to the Super Bowl. There's not overwhelming juggernauts in the NFC. I'm with you there. But the NFC South, the chances of that trend happening again for the second straight year are slim to none, meaning one team is going to have a better record 
over 500 and emerge. I don't know about over 500. Do you think we're going to go through another season where everybody in the NFC South is I, pretty I, much sub 500? I just think, like, who, who are they playing in the West? Or who are they playing Let me look. That's a good AFC. question. You talk about the schedule for yeah. the NFC South. Let me bring it up. I'm bringing up the Saints schedule to if, see if the other division. If they, they play have. the AFC West, <laughs> it's going to be the same thing. <laughs> Let's see. Well, here's thing, something to take into consideration. The NFC South has the AFC South. Oh, it could okay. be. It could be. They flip a coin on that one. It could be anything. Yeah. Well, they have the they're, division that the Giants yeah, played last they're, year. They're, okay. Then they can be above five hundred. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. So now all of a sudden you turn the corner. But I'll give you. Okay, to answer your question, the division they play in the NFC, they play the NFC North because they have the Packers, the Bears, the Vikings, and the Lions. So it's actually it's the equivalent to the Giants' schedule last year. Yeah. That's what the NFC South has. Yeah, and, and unless they play Chicago and Green Bay, you know, after October, and I'm pretty sure they don't. No, they do not. They play both of those teams between end of September, first week of November. First week of November. Oh, first week. Yeah, so Chicago is the team they are getting later than the date you had mentioned. And Green Bay, they're getting in the first three weeks of the season. And they're getting them in Chicago? They're getting them, no, at home in New Orleans. Oh, then they'll be fine. Okay. They'll, everybody will be fine. Oh, so see? Yeah. Well, it's, it's, it's now it's, rainbows it's, and yeah, lollipops yeah, yeah, it's, and they're, sunshine. They'll be, they'll be great. The Howard's coming around on the New Orleans Saints, people. Here we go. <laughs> if the Saints have to go outside in the cold, I'm like, yeah, that's a loss. <laughs> well, you want to know, since you went there, after the bye week, which is week 11, their remaining road games, they only have three road games, Atlanta in a dome, then they go to L.A. to play the Rams, and then they have the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Those yeah. are their three road trips. That's awesome. Why can't I get those? So on a Giants program, <laughs> I'm getting Howard to get very high on the New Orleans Saints. We didn't think we were going to enter this territory. Uh, now, would you like to press the envelope and have ultra confidence in another NFC South team? I got you to buy into one. Okay. Is there any other team that I could sell you on in the NFC South? The, the Pan Panthers? The Panthers, The Panthers, maybe. yes. Because Okay, so let's look at Carolina's schedule real quick. To see whether or not they're going to put Bryce in like Green Bay in like November. <laughs> so you don't think he's entering the equation until November? No, I'm saying they're going to put him his team in in Green Bay in November. That well, be... they have the Packers. They have the Packers at home though in Week 16. Okay, so they're not going to Lambeau Field late. Okay, that's warm. Okay, as far as How about trips Chicago? outdoors, they are visiting Chicago. They have the Bears on a Thursday night game, November 9th. That could be bad. Okay, so you don't feel very, very good about that, that. That could be very cold. Their other late road trips, they're going to Tampa in mm, December, no. New Orleans, Indoors. and Jacksonville. Outside. Yes, they're all warm. The South is like, they got it. They got the scheduling down. That's awesome. The conspiracy theory. Here well, we I'm go. Not going conspiracy. I don't know. Awesome. You know, you, you're Mr. <laughs> Opportunist on this program here. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm just saying. I didn't think we were going to go into this deep territory, but I'm amused. I'm, I'm very amused. I just got to go make sure my batteries are ready for my jacket. Just <laughs> well, that's right. Yes, we got to make sure the vest is in tip top shape <laughs> exactly. come this season. But I sense, I, I think you're starting to come around. I think the South is, they, they have a favorable schedule. What's going to happen with it? Again, I don't know. I think Jacksonville is going to be a much better team. I think they are. Well, Jacksonville showed some nice flashes late last yeah, season. So I would agree. I think they could very well be the team to beat in the AFC South. Uh, People are saying, watch out for Tennessee again. I don't know about that. Was it, what was it? Jacksonville, Tennessee. Who are the other two teams? Well, you got the Houston Texans. No. They'll be better. They'll be a lot better, but they won't be dangerous. Who's the last team? You got Indianapolis. And you have some changes, new coaching staff, new quarterback. Andy could be a problem. They're gonna they're gonna go back to running the ball with Definitely. Jonathan Taylor. Yeah. Yep, and their defense is okay. Even though yeah, they, well, even, they even, kept Gus Bradley even as a defensive we, coordinator. Even, even though we took their 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 lean tackler, <laughs> I think, yeah, I, think Bobby O'Carrick, I think, yeah. I think that they'll be okay. So it's gonna be a tougher division than it was last year. Okay, so now you went from lifting the NFC South to now bringing yeah. them back down to earth. You know, it's like a seesaw conversation. Anyway, here. go go to the go well, to no, the I, I just I want a firm Stay answer from you. No, no, no. Before we reopen up the phone lines, I want to be able to sleep well tonight, knowing where you stand. I'm going on the record and I'm saying the NFC South will not duplicate the track record and trend we saw last year. The uh -huh. chances of that happening. So I'm not saying everybody's going to win ten games, but we're going to have one team emerge. That is going to separate themselves from the pack, unlike last year. That I am confident in saying. No, it's just going to be a okay. lot. Of, it's going to be a lot of the same. There you go, people. 
It's going to be a lot of the same. There you go. In the weeds. <laughs> in the weeds. He's staying in the weeds. Yeah, I'm at Pearson. You know, Howard usually Lance, is a very Lance, committed individual. Lance is doing the, doing the schmelk thing. He's got into oh, a no, subject. Oh, no, no, Don't put me in his territory. You don't come on to a subject. You won't let it go. You keep asking questions about it. They're going to be the same group of guys. It's, it's fine. Don't worry about it. Okay. All right. Well, uh, I'll give you an out. We'll get to a caller here on the line just to change things up. That doesn't mean I'm finished. Scott's in New Mexico. He's here with us on BBK. Scott, What's happening, Scott? Tell him, tell him you understand what I'm saying, Scott. Tell him. <laughs> okay. Well, first, good afternoon, guys. Yes, good afternoon. Uh, uh, I ha- I'm a big believer that the season's coming down, and I always believe this, that it's predicated on the play of the offensive line. I wanted to cite two examples from last year and then get your opinion on what the Giants should do. Assuming that they'll be better statistically than they were last year, two games that I wanted to point out. This is in week three and week four of last year. In the Dallas game, uh, Daniel Jones was sacked five times, three recorded by Marcus Lawrence. Yep. He was hit 12 times and pressured 24 times. And since ESPN started keeping that statistic, that was the most any team had ever given up since 2009. You go to the next week, which I believe is against the Bears in week four, and Evan Neal, just to give you one site, one example, gave up no pressures, hurries, or sacks on 21 pass-blocking snaps. So this is a point, really, Lance, you addressed a lot of the times with consistency. And based on the present personnel, if the giant coaches are not sure that they have that consistency, and I'm not sure they have it either, does that alter the 53-man roster? In other words, you would keep maybe an extra tight end that you would normally not keep or an extra um, uh, fullback that you would normally not keep because you're not sure if that line is going to hold up against the kinds of pass rushes in your division which obviously you've illuminated a number of times on. And I was wondering if that makes a determination, because we don't know if Evan Neal is going to come out out of the blocks and start hitting, hitting it the way they expect him to. And I don't know who would replace him if they don't. And I, I, I'm hoping that doesn't happen. But I believe that both offense and defense, the way the Giants can score and keep other teams from scoring, really depends on the play of the offensive line. I've always believed that. And I was wondering if you share that same perspective and what it might do to the alterations of the of the players you keep on your team if they don't if they suspect if the coaches suspect that they don't have the consistency there, which I know Lance you always talk about. I was wondering to get your perspective on that point. All right, Scott. Well, we'll let you go on that note and appreciate the phone call. Well, Howard, I'm curious your perspective before I jump in. I want in to terms you, of a, oh, you want me to set I the want stage you to set here? The stage, this yeah. is where you want me to go. Well, first of all, I think the Giants feel a little bit better about the depth of the offensive line. So before, Howard, we even bring the tight ends into the conversation, if Scott's question was about how that impacts who you keep on the roster, if they feel good about the swing tackle and some of the other interior guys, if, God forbid, somebody doesn't live up to expectations, first you're going to turn to making a change to an offensive lineman before you necessarily start to play 1,500 additional tight ends. <laughs> so I wouldn't go to that extreme. And here's the other thing. With respect to the tight ends, we know Waller and Bellinger are making the roster. They made the effort to bring in a guy like Tommy Sweeney, who they brought in from the Bills. Sweeney's a blocker. Mm-hmm. That has been his skill set. So if Sweeney has any chance of making the roster, it's not because he on all of a sudden goes out and catches 20 balls in the preseason. Mm. Okay, They know who Sweeney is. So if they feel he warrants a roster spot, he's going to prove his consistency in terms of blocking. I mean, if anything, the question is, do you keep four tight ends versus three? And that's where a guy like Lawrence Cager comes into play. All right, so let, let's do this. Set the offensive line right now. We, we got we get Jones and Neal, and we'll call Schmitz. We'll, we're going to say yeah, he's going to make absolutely. Now give me the two interior guys. The two interior right now, if the season started tomorrow, my answer would be Bredesen and Glowinski. All right. So let's say out of the five guys, we'll say that Schmitz is doing a decent job. Let's say Thomas is doing a really, really good job, and and, and Neil's doing okay. One of the guards is doing okay. Who's the first replacement? The first replacement for a guard or a tackle? A guard first. First replacement for a guard would be, to me, Josh Azudu. Azudu, okay. He'd be the first man up if you want to make a change. So let's say uh, – Neil is not doing well. Who replaces him? I would go with Tyree Phillips. Tyreek Phillips. 
let's say that Thomas hurts his ankle again. He's out. What happens then? So meaning you were ready in this hypothetical. I just want to we're, follow. We're okay. doing all hypothetical. Like who, no, no, no. Who, who well, I, but I want to, before I give you my answer, has Phillips replaced Neil no, no, and no. now Thomas no, gets no, hurt? No, 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 this, no. We're just saying, I'm just saying, every time I mention a guy, yeah. that's the only guy that's hurt. Okay, then I would, once again, I turn to Phillips to replace Andrew Thomas. So you would take Phillips to go to the left tackle, he can play left or right? Yes, that would be my response. Okay. Yes. Right. I mean, you could throw Matt Parrott into the conversation. I still think Phillips proved when he came in last year. Mm -hmm. I mean, you could bring Corey Cunningham into the conversation, too. I'd still go Phillips over Parrott, as it so stands right now. So then your five offensive linemen, as you have them set, yep. uh, Brennison and Golinski, your, so your, your first alternate, uh, that plays swing in the three positions inside is who? Is Azudu. Azudu. Can, yep. can he play center? Well, he didn't do that in North Carolina. He's gotten in some snaps here or there in practice. I think the jury is still out about okay. whether or not he's a reliable center. Well, so, I wouldn't go that far. All right, so, so you need another guy to interior. serve as the insurance policy. Well, that's where J.C. Eisenhower comes into play. Okay, so those, those two guys are going to have to make the team, and then you need one tackle to be available to play. And then you need one tackle for the for the practice squad. And who's your first tackle? Tyree Phillips. All right. Yeah. So that's 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 how you go with it. Well, yeah. I mean, well, basically, what you laid out is you're looking at about nine offensive linemen. You're going to keep. We're well, going to look at. You're probably going to keep more than that, but you're going to have to have some on your practice squad. To of call. course. Yeah. So you got your Who five, you can always you, call. You, up. you always have your five starters. You have your swing tackle. You have your swing guard. All right. So those your swing tackle and your swing guard make seven linemen. You carry eight on every game. And you got to have a guy that can play center. Then somebody's got to snap the ball. Yep. And that's it. Here's another scenario I want to throw out now that I think about it. I could see if you want to make a change at center, you could move Bredesen to center and Azudu takes Bredesen's place at guard. Where's Schmitz? Well, Schmitz would be replaced under your hypothetical, okay. right? right? I okay. mean, if, if we're making a change at center, I'm assuming John yeah, Michael okay. Schmitz yeah. is not out there anymore. Okay. That's right. So that's another thing to take into consideration. Okay. But could as Schmitz play one of the guards? I think Schmitz could. We actually, John and I spoke to PJ Fleck. You'll see that on an upcoming Giants Huddle podcast. He indicated that in a scenario where you did want to explore, he has confidence that he could move over and okay. kick out to guard. I don't think, though, that that would be the first move by the Giants. Okay. I would think they would go with somebody that's had a little bit more experience in that yeah, department. Because so, he was solely a center yeah, at so, Minnesota. So it takes eight guys to be. Uh, oh, absolutely. It takes eight guys for a game for a 53 man roster to actually play. Those eight guys have to be ready and available because yep. you just don't know. And because like we've seen games where they've s circled guys and oh, okay and try yeah, to figure know. out who's going to play and who's not going to play, and only the quarterback has the the emergency position. So you have to have at least three guys on the offensive line. Now to come full circle to the question, do the Giants say to themselves, are they going to keep more tight ends? No. Because of maybe some questions on the O line, and I'm with you. I don't think that changes no, not, anything. It's, just, it's yeah. not. It's not the way teams are constructed. You have to have the yep. offensive lineman. If you had a tack, had a tight end that could like, you know, block somebody that could really like, Bellinger's going to do a good job. I don't think Bellinger's going to be able to, to hold up on a pat a real pass rusher. Maybe he can this year because he's probably a little stronger. But you know, being able to set your feet, get back in position, like I can remember, like uh, who are we playing against Dallas and having to play against. Charles Haley, and then thinking to myself, I mean, uh, I'm like, holy shit. You said a few prayers before the game. I'm like, then, I'm like yeah. uh, you know, I guess they could turn to protection. I could block him. Coach said, we're going to turn to protection. You're going to have to block him. I'm like, what? <laughs> I'm like, if the tackle can't block him. <laughs> what makes you think I'm going to block him? And I'm saying, he goes, just get off the line of scrimmage. Oh, you want me to give him a running start? Oh, that's real. That's, that's going to work great. He goes, why are they letting you do this? I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, you could you could get in a bad position. <laughs> yeah, well, and but I think you bring up the important point: the tight end is not going to substitute the need of the offensive lineman. That's what I, it comes again, back to. I did the best I could through my years when I played. And I, you know, when I heard a lot about I'm the best blocker, or whatever, blah blah blah. But there were guys that I'm like, yeah, okay, that's not going to work. So you know, you're gonna you're gonna get a lot of guys you can take, a lot of guys you can manipulate and do stuff to, and you're gonna get some guys to be like, okay, a tight end is not going to block me. And that's his mentality. I'm yeah. going to go forward. He's going to have to put on everything he has to like stop me. <laughs> and I was big for a tight end, and, they, and it was like, mm -mm, some of these guys are too big. So, you know, the, the question is a good question, but no, you have to have the right amount of offensive linemen on your 53-man roster. If you keep an extra tight end or something, it's usually because he can play out of the backfield, and he's a great special teamer. 
So there you go. You had a firm answer from Howard on how the roster will be constructed, but the jury is still out about the state of the NFC South. We leave you disappointed on this program. We try to appease everybody, but we leave, unfortunately, some of you empty-handed. As usual, is one of our shortcomings. Yes, yes, very. Well, speaking of short, that leaves us time just to wrap up the show. Just enough. Just a, a few inches with respect to that as we try to throw out all the puns humanly possible to wrap up the festivities. I'm sorry, Larry. No, it's okay. Don't worry about it. I can roll with any punches. I have heard worse. I've been called worse. I will go wipe away my tears I, I, I after did, this program ends. call you short as is part of our shortcoming. Oh, <laughs> yes, 100%. Yeah, but notice the emphasis on short. I'm glad your pronunciation is tip-top. Notice you weren't emphasizing Cummings in that word. Yes. I'm sorry. Yeah, you can tell we're getting the indication to wrap up the show with that being said we appreciate everybody for tuning in to today's episode of big blue kickoff live it's part of the giants platforms everywhere and giants.com slash podcast we will be up and about and returning to planet earth tomorrow with wednesday's edition of big blue kickoff live for howard cross i'm lance meadow stay locked to giants.com for all the latest we're out have a good one